but because uh, the team is playing games, we of course also have a game designer. And I'm not sure if she's also into offline games, but if you you should you should master poker because I think you're great at bluffing. Because I read that you landed a job as a game designer with just three months of experience, so you must be great at that. Uh, her name is Xandra van Wijk. She's now the lead game designer at King Games, and she will tell a little bit more about how that happened and also uh, talk about the process of designing for live games. So, please welcome Xandra. Okay. Hey guys. Hello. So, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for being here. Uh, so yeah, I hope to give you an idea what it does, what I do as a game designer, because a lot of people ask, you, you know, if you have no idea what it is and how I got this job. Um, so about me, my name is Xandra van Wijk. Uh, yeah, I'm a lead game designer king. So I'm from the Netherlands, but I'm living in London now for three years because I moved there for the job. And I'm the pet of two British short hair cats. Those are my furry babies right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm the game designer on Farm Hero Saga uh, previously and now on Farm Hero Super Saga. So Farm Hero Saga is a match three game it's the second biggest franchise from uh, King after Candy Crush. Uh, to give you an idea of the numbers, <laughs> oh uh, I think King did previous year in the fourth quarter uh, about 146 million US dollars in revenue and uh, about 2 billion US dollars in revenue over the whole year of 2015. And we have about 128 million daily active users uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. So that's kind of to give you an idea of the size of these games. Uh, so about you, uh, so I read up on, because I had no idea what I signed up for when I said yes to doing a talk at the campus party. So I found out that you guys should be uh, between the age of 18 and 30 years old. You're mostly students or entrepreneurs. And I assume that you have an interest in games or at least finding a work that you're passionate about. I mean, I'm assuming that's why you came here to this talk. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, oh yeah, can I first get a raise of hands? Like, how many of you know what you want to do in about five years from now? Okay, and how many of you are feel like you're what you're doing right now contributes to that what you'll be doing in five years from now? Oh, that's pretty good. And how many of that are actually looking for a career in games, more specifically? Okay, cool. Well, I think you guys are ahead of me then, because I didn't figure out that I wanted to be a game designer until I was 28 years old. Uh, so why is that? Because I was crazy about games. Like, I've been playing games my whole life. And I actually studied industrial design engineering at the Delft University of Technology. But still, it took me about 10 years or something to put the two together. So why is that? Uh, so apparently, Socrates said, you don't know what you don't know. Well, that's, that's the truth. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I do know now what I didn't know then, so I'm hoping to talk to you about that and maybe inspires more of you to pursue a career in games. So the first thing I didn't know was that you can actually earn a living in games, because when I was playing games, I just never thought of it as a profession. Like somehow I didn't think about all the people that were making these games. I just thought of it as something that I did in my spare time. But actually, you might be interested to know that it's a super big industry right now, because in uh, this is the revenues of the global gaming market in 2015. It had a 91.5 billion revenue. And if you compare that to the movie industry, uh, they only had like about 88.5 billion. Uh, so we're already bigger than the gaming industry. Uh, and this is only looking to grow still, because especially the mobile gaming market is still really growing a lot. Uh, so the second thing I didn't know was like what kind of job could you do in the gaming industry? Like I didn't really have any reference because I guess the first reference I had is like, okay, you can be this superstar kind of game developer at a triple A company. I was like, how do you apply for that? Uh, the second was uh, you had to be an indie game developer. So you had to start by yourself, which also was, I mean, I really admired that, but it was really Im intimidating for me. So I still didn't really feel comfortable like thinking of like, that's what I'm going to do when I'm finished with uni. And then it wasn't until my dear friend Iris Kronstiver started working at a social gaming company that I actually got introduced to the possibility of a social gaming company. Um, so I guess also lack of role models kind of played a, uh, a part in this. So to kind of illustrate you, I wanna kind of put my ex-colleague in the spotlight, uh, Isabel Davis, because I think she's amazing, because she shatters a lot of stereotypes. Because this girl, she likes, so she likes K-pop and cosplay, but she's also an esports lawyer. 
So when she went to law school, everyone thought she was crazy, but she still managed to find her career in, in games. Um, and then the last thing that I didn't know was, I didn't know I was qualified. I thought to be a game designer, you had to be programming games since you were 10 years old. And I never programmed a game. I never made a game. Even before I actually got hired at King, I never made a game. But here I am. So games industry, why? So why would you want to work in the games industry? Well, first of all, if you love games, it's great because you get to play a lot of games. And even though King makes mobile games, I also am encouraged to play a lot of console games and PC games and everything. Uh, so yeah, that's great. Um, the second part is, it's a great culture. Uh, I think even before I got hired at King, I was always involved in the gaming industry with volunteering for various odd jobs. I'll talk a bit more about that later. But I already felt this connection with the people that worked in the industry. It's super casual. It is super fun. Uh, at King as well, we have this saying, like, we got to we got to have fun to make fun, and that is totally true. And it's also a very diverse culture. Like at the top right, uh, that is the London Pride Parade. So King was represented there as well. We have our own LGBT group. Uh, we do game board nights. Uh, twice a year we go with the entire company to, uh, to have the King Foam Market, which is kind of like our internal, uh, how do you call it, E3 or something, where we discuss ideas for the game and uh, for the company and have a great party. Uh, and thirdly, I think also for people that might not uh, consider uh, a career in games but are actually doing something technical, I think it's very challenging and it's actually very interesting to see how you can combine creativity and science. Uh, because I think especially maybe making mobile games is very much like designing a product. So game designer, what do I do when, I, when people ask me this? So some people might think, my friends think, you know, I'm in this typical millennium uh, company with beanbags. Yes, that's true. Uh, what my family thinks I do, I play a lot of games. Yes, I do that too. Uh, what society thinks I do, like often when you say you're a game designer, people like people think that you're coding the games, but actually I don't. Um, this is an internal joke because this is the business performance unit, but actually we get along really well. So, so what do I really do? Uh, I like to start with a metaphor. So one of the metaphors that I really like to use is Imagine the game designer as being uh, a scout. So if, if your gaming team is uh, like a caravan and you have different professions within that caravan, like uh, woodworkers, blacksmiths, merchants, etc., then I'm the, ga the scout. So what does that mean? Uh, as a game designer, it's your job, obviously, to design uh, a new game. And you do that by having a certain vision uh, and by communicating clearly to your team uh, how to get there. So you need several skills. So first of all, obviously the vision. You need to have an idea where you're going. So you need to know the lay of the land. You need to know the requirements of your team. Like the blacksmiths might need to be close to water or something, whatever. Uh, the second thing that you need to do uh, is, is have, obviously you need to be creative. Like you need to know how to survive by yourself. You always need to stay ahead of the team because ideally, uh, when you kind of do all the exploring, so when the rest of the team comes there, so when the developers need to start programming the game and when the artists need to start drawing the stuff that you have already spec'd it out, you've already done all the exploratory uh, work for them. And then the third really important skill is communication because you need to keep your team uh, continuously updated uh, and you need to make the, the, the blueprints basically so that when they arrive at that ideal spot that you've chosen that they can immediately start building and putting stuff together. So that, that's kind of what you do as a game designer. So what does that mean in my day-to-day -day job? Yes, I talk a lot to people. I get a lot of questions. You make a lot of game design documents. I don't code. Uh, I actually use uh, PowerPoint the most. Uh, I use that to make mock-ups of screens to basically anything to help you I explain your ideas better. And I make screen flows, et cetera. And I write a lot. Um, so in the beginning, I never saw the connection between industrial design engineering and game design. But now that I've worked in game design for about three years, I think they are um, super similar because the whole design process is exactly the same. It's like whether I'm uh, tuning levels or whether I'm designing a big new feature, it always starts with identifying a need. Uh, then you imagine and you develop possible solutions. You'll usually like do brainstorms to involve the team as well. Then you plan, so you make a prototype. 
you create and you test and evaluate, and finally you improve. So to give you an example, uh, to go a bit more into detail, uh, this was a, uh, the Farm Club Companions was a really big extension we did to the game for, far, uh, for Farm Heroes. So we did this when the game was about one year old, and we identified a need that uh, players were getting stuck in the game a lot. So we wanted to create a new feature that would help players get through the game and at the same time make use of certain things that were underused in the game. Uh, so like so these are the these are the companions. So the companions were these animals that you could collect in the game. So you would play a level and on depending on your star rating, you would unlock the one star, two star or three star animals. And then in the course of three chapters, once you've collected all the animals, players will be rewarded with a little booster. So we had this system in the game already, but it was very limited use. Like you would players would only get a benefit from it once in every three episodes. Uh, and also we had this magic bean system in the game, which was really underused as well. So we came up with the idea for the Farm Club Companions that we wanted to add a, functional, uh, a functionality to them. So we had this idea that players will be able to choose an animal and take it into the level with them and the animal would somehow help them. So the next step was then imagining what they would look like. So obviously the biggest challenge here was that this system was already in the game. So we already had about 150 farm club animals, which we would be retrofitting with an ability that could actually impact the pass rates. So without going into too much technical detail here, I kind of give you an idea of the design challenge that we're working with, is we defined certain abilities for the animals. Like, okay, um, so, in this so maybe I need to explain this game. It's like a match three game and you uh, beat a level by um, collecting certain objectives. Like for example, collect 50 strawberries and you collect uh, strawberries by ma making a match three. So one of the abilities we came up with, for example, we have basic abilities that would give you more of the crop seeds that you were collecting. Uh, we had other abilities like breaking ice or growing flowers, stuff that would clear blockers of the board. Uh, so now what we had to do was we also decided that uh, one of the design decisions was for example, okay, players are gonna have to choose one out of three animals uh, for each level because it would just be so overwhelming for users to pick one animal from 150 possible solutions, right? And you don't know uh, what if that ability is gonna be useful in the level. So we basically had to come up with a program. We worked together with the BPU who made this tool for me so I could see uh, basically what the most used uh, cropsies were in levels and what the most used goals were, so I could manually kind of make a combination of uh, what, I'll, I'll, get, I'll do questions later, uh, of like, uh, so I could manually kind of make the combinations for animal abilities, and then we made uh, an algorithm that would kind of suggest uh, animals based on the data that we had from the levels. I don't know if that explains it, but I can answer questions uh, later. Uh, so then how you plan and test this is, based on this algorithm, just quickly did a test. So I'll just quickly took uh, an episode, uh, uh, like a random episode, and I looked at these levels and then ran the algorithm, see which three animals were suggested per each level, and then compared it also with the star ratings from uh, that we had from players, so I could get a general impression of which le uh, animals they would have unlocked. And kind of, you know, then you can already get a feeling of like, okay, does this seem reasonable or not? So then after that, we implemented it. So obviously a lot of design was involved here as well. It's like, how are you gonna uh, show these animals? How are players gonna be able to select it? How are you gonna visualize what, ab what the abilities were without you know, adding too much text and everything? And then you know, how do you show how the animal triggers and everything? And then lastly, we tested it. So we had on one side, we had the quantitative data. So I could see exactly like how certain animals were affecting the pass rates and I uh, rebalanced them, you know, sometimes they were too strong, sometimes they were too weak. And also we did uh, qualitative research, like we had a player insights team who would invite a panel of players and would ask them if they understood what the, the, what the feature was and if they would uh, likely uh, use it or not. So in the end we had really good results because uh, like our main goal was to improve retention and intention was uh, retention was improved by 10% and it also actually affected monetization because players were now going through the levels and were spending more again. So finally, uh, King. I like to talk about like, to give you an idea now, like now that you have an impression of what it does to be a, uh, what it's like to be a game designer. So how do you get a job like this? So I'll just talk about how I got this job. 
so it started out with basically I didn't know what I wanted to do since I was uh, about uh, 18 years old. I just started doing any kind of activity in the gaming industry. I've, I've I think I've done almost everything. Like I've I've been volunteer at events. I've been a shoutcaster. I've been a booth babe. I've been a professional professional Call of Duty player, and I was a host for IGN Benelux as well. So in the end, all of this basically helped me figure out what I wanted to do in games because I had no clue. And it helped me get a first job at Spill Games as a community manager. And from there on, I got to know the industry from the inside out and finally decided that I wanted to be a game designer. Uh, so my, my path is just one of many examples how you can become a game designer. And just to show you, because I think maybe a lot of you are doing like a game design course now, but I had no clue and I thought I kind of messed up. I, I thought I couldn't make it anymore. But to give you a few more examples, this is my colleague Jay Foreman. He used to be a policeman before he became, uh, before he started at QA at Blizzard, and now he's a game designer at King. Uh, Matt Baker, he was a roadie before he also started into QA, and now is a game designer. Uh, Carolyn Krenzer, she was a uh, management and strategy consultant at Accenture, and now she's a producer. And now actually now she's the interim head of studio of our, uh, of our company. And like I said, if you already know what you want to do from the start, you can just do a game design course like Katija and also become a game designer. So there are many ways to become a game designer. Um, so the second thing that is really key is networking, because I think it's very important that you do all these different activities to figure out like what it is that you like about game design, because you might think like, oh, I really like playing games, but it doesn't mean that you might like making games. Uh, and there are so many different roles in the games industry. Uh, but in order to get these opportunities, it's really important that you network. And networking doesn't mean going into an event, handing out your business card, shaking everyone's hands. I think it's like you just make connections that are, you know, I, I never thought of it as networking. Because I remember my dad, who's right here, um, used to tell me, like, when I was 25 years old, he was like, he was the first one to point out, actually, saying, like, what are you going to do with this? I'm like, what do you mean? Because I did all these different things. And he was like, well, you've got a network now. I was like, what? Network? I thought these were my friends, you know. I didn't think of it that way. But um, yeah, so I think that is important. Just go out there, meet people that do similar things than you are, and like don't talk to people because they are uh, at a certain position, because you never know where they're gonna end up. And you know, y before you know it, you'll have friends and they'll be your network. And then the third thing, which was really key in me getting this job, was uh, basically fortune favors the bold. Because if I tell the story, it always feel I always feel like I got incredibly lucky, but I guess I didn't just get lucky. I also kind of dared to ask. Because the way I got at King was that I was actually working at another gaming company and I just uh, got the role as game designer. I just made a switch from product manager to game design. Uh, they gave me a chance. I'm super thankful for that still. Uh, so I was three months into this new function and then I went to the GDC. And at GDC, King had a, had a stand and they had a competition. Like if you play this Candy Crush competition, you could win an iPad. So I passed by and at that point I was totally addicted to Candy Crush. So I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have a peek. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I actually managed to beat the, the record on my first attempt. So I didn't think much of it because I thought maybe I just got lucky. Um, but I decided, you know what, I'm going to queue up again so just so that I slow down anyone else who might break my record. And I just want to try to see if I can break my record again. And I managed to do that. And I remember from that a moment that I got such a good impression from King because I still remember the HR lady there. She was rooting for me and like screaming her head out like when I was <laughs> was winning and I thought like this person like they were really funny so of course at that time they were kind of joking like oh you should join King and I was like oh yeah you know whatever like I didn't really seriously consider that because I was really happy at where I was but as things happened when I got home in that week I actually got uh, my my contract I heard that my contract wasn't going to be renewed because the studio was actually closing down so now it's kind of in the ruts, like, well, I only have three months of experience as a game designer. You know, I'm going to have to start all over again, and this is not going to work out. So I still thought, like, you know what, I'm going to apply at the biggest gaming comp social gaming company there is at the moment. just going to give it a shot. Uh, I actually applied as a junior product manager because that was the one thing I had one year experience in. So I got a few calls. I uh, did a Skype interview. I was totally sold. Like, the more people I talked to, I was like, I want to work there because they were. I had a really, really good impression. Uh, but then I got the news that actually I was rejected because they thought I had too little experience. So I was really down. Uh, I happened to call uh, a friend uh, after the interview and I told him how about how it went. And I remember him talking to me. He said, you know, the fact that you're too junior, that's bullshit. He said, you know, 
companies just want to be uh, convinced that you can do this job. And you know, that's why they're going to look at your CV because it kind of gives them some guarantee. But in the end, you know, one job is never the other. Then you know, it's really hard to put in uh, a job description what you need to do. So he said, like, you just need to convince them. He said, like, if I asked you right now, can you do this job? Can you do it? So I was like, yeah, I can do this job. So he completely fired me up. So after that, I sent them another email and I thanked them for, well, thank you for forwarding my CV to the other studios, but I really want to work at London. And I'm a fast learner. If it's about the gaming experience, you know, if it's about the experience, if you give me this opportunity in three months, I will have this experience. If you don't like it, you can let me go in ex expiration, you know, the, how you call it, the temporary date uh, time. Uh, so anyways, and I managed to convince them because they were like, well, you know, maybe we've got something for you after all. And then they let me do uh, a game design test. And in the end, I got hired. So I would have never thought going before, you know, that, that I would get hired at King with only three months experience. But it worked out. So I think it's really important that if you really want something, like, don't be afraid to ask. So summary. So please consider a, uh, a career in games, because I think it's really fun. If you have a technical background, you know, I hope this kind of gave you an insight of what it's like to be in the gaming industry. I think also the gaming industry really needs a lot of diversity, so I'm specifically looking at the women out there. I hope you think about, you know, being becoming a game designer maybe. Um, try different things to find out what you like. I mean, I, you know, maybe you're not convinced after this talk that game design is anything for you, but still I would really recommend you to do, well then find out what you do like, you know, because I think passion is important. Um, build your network, and lastly, don't be afraid to ask. So again, kind of like thinking about that scout um, analogy, I think you can apply the same to your, to your own career and you just need to get out there and design your own career. So I'll leave you with this image. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And I think you said there were already questions during your talk. So yeah, I saw someone that person needs to have the mic first. Yeah, yeah. over there. Here you go. Hi. Uh, Hi. Good talk. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I have uh, three questions. Yes. Um, first of all, what is a BPU? Oh, that's a business performance unit. And what so does it do? So basically, they are the they are like consistent of uh, data scientists and data analysts. So they l grab all the data from our games and help us make sense of all of that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, second question. Yeah. Um, what is a game to you? What is a game to me? Yes. What does it What does it mean? What does it mean? Mm. Uh, I think a game is an experience. It's entertainment. Uh, it's something to keep you busy to have fun. Okay, um, last question if I can. Yep. Um, how do you avoid the Skinner box? The Skinner box? Um, uh, it's there with conditioning. So uh, a lot of m uh, social games, they um, condition people to play on and play on yes. uh, by giving them uh, rewards, fast rewards. Um, well, that is good to keep uh, like attention for a game. Um, often it gets more attention than uh, the the narrative or the depth of the game itself. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, how do you, what do you think about that? Um, I think to be, I mean, I, th I think this is something like that's a you know something that we usually with a among other game designers at King usually talk about because we you know we we're all gamers as well like we we all play console games as well so we do care about narrative and stuff. And we're always talking about like how can we bring this into our games more and more, but to be very honest, like usually when I'm uh, when I'm designing a game as well, like for example, Farm Hero Super Saga, I had this whole like I had a whole one page of like a storyboard of like what the story would be, etc. And then in the end, I think maybe also because of our audience, like our audience is super broad. It's not just gamers. It's like anyone plays Candy Crush at least, you know. So I think you have to keep that in mind. And in the end, you really have to look at our audience. And I think that they what they play our games for is they because they love the minute to minute gameplay and i think they honestly you know as, as like as a game designer i care about the characters i don't think our, ga our our gaming audience cares about it so much so i think it also really depends on like the type of game that you have so for a puzzle game i think narrative is just not you know that important it's not not like a telltale game or anything so i hope that answers your kinds of questions okay any more questions ah that's easy <laughs> Uh, hello, congratulations on the talk. Thank you. And uh, I want to ask about the the industry, like uh, 
There are the big gaming companies, and there are so many, like, small game developers doing new games. Yeah. And the platforms nowadays, you basically have the classic consoles, and you have the PC, and you have Android and iPhone. But when you look around the campus party, there are a lot of new platforms and new te technologies coming up. Are these game developers thinking about how to use this and how to create these new uh, new games for these platforms? And how's the market there nowadays? Um, so I, 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 I'm sure I cannot comment on whatever King is doing, and I'm not even 100% aware of what they are doing. But I'm sure that uh, yeah, I, I'm sure like they're like uh, VR probably is what you're thinking about as well. That yeah, I, I know a lot of uh, like I, I for example know some colleagues that left King that are now doing their own thing, and I'm sure some of them are also looking into uh, into VR and stuff, because, yeah, I guess there's a lot of opportunity now, since, you know, the, the it's not it's not the established, it's not really established yet, so you s I guess you have a bigger chance if you're pioneering into a new area, so, I mean, I, I can't talk for King, but I know that, in general, I know that game developers definitely look into that, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Ah, the gentleman in the back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, th I imagine that as a, um, a game designer, you work with uh, a lot of uh, people from different fields, like designers and programmers. And um, I was wondering, uh, I was wondering, how do you uh, balance um, the views of those people? Because in my experience, like designers want this certain look or feel, and then yeah. the, the developers say, "Well, it's technically too difficult." Um, so, uh, how do you manage those different views? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very good question. Um, I think the funny thing is, is that I think the import most important thing that you need in a team is trust. And I think, like at at, at King, I really trust the team that I work with. They're all brilliant. So first of all, I will really uh, uh, how you call it, value their their opinion. And then basically how we decide is like we just go head to head. Like if we, if I and the artist, for example, disagree on something, we'll be squabbling. Like I I've had people coming over sometimes because they were like, "Are you guys okay?" Because apparently we were like very loud and people thought we were in a blazing row, but we were actually just you know we we just have arguments. So in the end, because I'm like as a game designer, you're not a dictator. You know, you're not a Napoleon. You're just it's not my way or the highway. So in the end, I think it's really important that you just manage to convince each other, you know, like I'll be able to convince the artist or not. And then in the end, I think it always comes down to like, if we really cannot agree, it just comes down to like, what is it this thing that we're not agreeing, uh, uh, agreeing on? Like, is it who has the most benef benefit of it? You know, like for example, um, if it is about something visual that I, did I disagree on with the artist, you know, if it's about, for example, the color of a character, then you know what? It's his say in the end because that's his, you know, artistic vision, whatever. However, if it is something that I think really changes people's, uh, you know, the usability of the game because it's going to be unclear, then I get the last say on it. So I think that's kind of how we decide. Good answer. Any more questions, maybe? Yeah, there's one over there. Ah, there. I have a vision of bigger gaming companies that they uh, initially want to make a lot of money. Uh, do you think this commercial idea destroys your creativity as a game designer? Um, well, obviously, there's always like a, a very interesting tension there. Uh, but actually, I think that uh, that's that's not necessarily true because, like, or at least at King, we're very aware of like we always want to make great games. That is like the that is above everything, you know. Like because if you do yeah, it, it, it all starts with a great game. Like. Um but yeah, I think uh, I think actually. So sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> About <laughs> if if uh, the commercial idea uh, influences you in your creativity. Oh, so yeah, you want sorry. to make a commercial game? Yeah. Well, I I I think of it in this way: is that w w what we are doing at King is I think it's more similar to maybe to product design than. Game design is an art form because obviously you know if you're an independent d developer, you you can kind of you know your vision is the everything. Uh, for us, it's not the case because we're we are a company. We need to make money, and we like like I said, we have a really big audience. So I think of it as a product design. Sometimes you know you need to satisfy uh, their their uh, wishes. But in in the same sense, I feel like it's not less creative because actually you know it's it's it is a very it's a very interesting challenge. You know, like how can you do this but still you know, make it better, and we're always trying to, yeah, always trying to improve, basically. Okay, thank you. I think you're probably available for more questions uh, for of the audience uh, later on. Yeah.
Thank you very much, Xander. It was really yeah. interesting. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your time. Um,